This is uh, the resilient audience that's going to hear about resilient cities. So everybody relax and brace yourselves. It's also a tough act to follow the quintessential panel, so the pressure's on, y'all. Um, uh, and also the very good hair panel, as we were discussing. So, um, so uh, I'm gonna completely break the fourth wall here and, and say that these people are all already collaborating. So, so it, it sounds like they're working together, they are, and that is a very good thing, because they're all coming from different places. And I'm also gonna start with a false construct. Um, not who I am, though. I'm Sharon Burke. I'm a senior advisor at New America, and I work for the International Security Program. And previously, I was the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy in the Obama administration. And here's my false construct, is that this is a climate change panel, and they are all going to knock that down completely as we go along. One of the reasons I wanted to introduce this as a climate change panel is that as a defense official, I often got told that climate change was a security problem and that the United States Armed Forces need to deal with it. It is a security problem. It, it hits security at the very basic sense, but it is not a military problem because there's no military solution. You can't send your special operations forces out to attack it and fix it and change it and destroy it. You can send them to respond when that, when that need comes, but that's not going to be good enough. So cities are really on the front lines, and they are also the key actor in dealing with climate change as a shock and a stress to systems all over the world. Right now, more than half of the world's population lives in cities. I think by 2050, it's expected to be about two-thirds of the mm -hmm. world's population. Uh, there are about 28 megacities that have 10 million people each. And then, of course, a lot of people live in growing cities. So this is where the action is, and that's what we're going to talk about is, as on the front lines of change, where all the shocks and stresses of the world are concentrated, how do cities deal with that? And I can tell you now, it's a lot more expensive in monetary and human terms to just react and respond, and terribly unsatisfying. So we're very fortunate to have this great panel here. We have Nikhil da Victoria Lobo, who is from Swiss Re, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about what that means. We have Pamela Puchowski, and you say it the way that you say it. Puchowski. Puchowski, um, who is an urbanist, a social entrepreneur, a startup expert, um, who's worked with cities and entities all over the place as a non-resident fellow at Brookings Institution, um, and just a tremendously creative force in this field with, with how to change cities. And then we have with us Max Young who is the Vice President for Global Communications, is that right? Yeah. For uh, the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative of the Rockefeller Foundation. And he's gonna tell us a little bit more about that. But I wanted to start, if we're talking about the problem and the solution, what is the problem we're solving for? Because if we talk about building resilient cities, why? What is the problem? Nikhil, as a, as a Vice President for such a large reinsurance firm, Tell us what the problem is. What's the risk? Mm -hmm. And why does your firm invest in it? And, and please, you can start by explaining what reinsurance is. Sure. I think we all know what insurance is, but well, what's reinsurance? Uh, you know, I know a lot of people stepped out for coffee, so I don't want to put everyone to sleep. They're listening who's, out there. Don't worry. About insurance and reinsurance. But um, very simply put, reinsurance, um, which is a very old industry, is the insurance of insurance companies. Um, the unit I work in is one that was set up to exclusively work on the insurance for the public sector. So it's a very new concept, the idea that beyond the everyday risks uh, a government may face for its you know, buildings, for its, let's say, employees, it faces a risk from big shocks to our national economies that in the end get picked up by the public sector balance sheet. And I think of all the risks we look at, things like an aging population, um, issues about uh, you know, um, shifts in where people are located, urbanization, uh, climate change is a, a massive risk. And So why? Tell us. Uh, and I think for a couple of reasons. I think one is um, purely, let's say we look at the insurance and reinsurance industry. You know, Swiss Re is 151 years old. And if you look at how losses have developed, when we say insurance losses over the last 150 years, um, particularly in the last 20, 30 years, there's no doubt that we're seeing um, increased loss burdens, which means higher insurance costs, a much more volatile insurance industry, and difficulty for us to respond as a private company to the needs of our shareholders. Um, but I think even deeper than that, um, as a company that 
takes very much its role in keeping the global economy functioning. What we see is that if we're not putting a price tag on these risks, someone unknowingly is picking up the cost. And that is absolutely certainly the public sector. And so that's why for us, cities are the front line because we need to provide them new tools to at least isolate the, what that cost is, ideally ensure some of that, but also make cost benefit decisions on how they want to mitigate against this climate risk. Because I mean, just last year in the United States alone, I think there were eight major weather disasters mm -hmm. that cost a billion dollars. Yes. So the insurance industry takes that on the chin as well yep. as the people in the affected areas is what you're saying. Yeah, and I, I think it's not just, um, again, it's definitely an issue about for the insurance industry about better managing our risks, developing new markets. But in the end, it's also a question that, uh, and you know, our group was started after the uh, tsunami in Asia. And at the time, our board reflected on the fact that you had this material economic event to all these countries, and yet for the insurance industry, it was a non-event. It was basically a couple of hotels that led to insurance losses. And what we concluded is that if your industry is going to be material in the future, you have to respond to the events that really matter now. And clearly, our industry believes that we step forward when bad things happen. And therefore, we need to expand and grow into this area to protect governments against these, these shocks that are unpredictable. So there's no, so again, this is, this is, a, this is a matter of math of what, of what you need to protect against. Exactly. And it's what you're already seeing. Yep. All right, so Pamela, in that context, now if we have the problem defined and that there's risk and cost going on, um, talk to us about you know, if resilience is a strategy, which is what mm -hmm. I think you were using other words to talk about to mitigating yes. the risk. Um, define resilience for us, because it's become something of sure. a buzzword. So what, what does it really mean? Sure. Um, resilience is fundamentally a local issue, uh, and it's also a practice. So it's a practice of communities, certainly of governments, um, at the local scale in particular, and of businesses. And the, the fundamental concept behind the practice is that you are planning, preparing, responding, and recovering from risk, risks that you know, and risks that you don't know. So the concept around the data of what is it that you're trying to buttress yourself against, and, and again, it playing out at the community scale, is part of the complexity, managing complexity. That absolutely involves the emergency management, um, knowing how to respond, and within a climate change, knowing not, not knowing when the storm is gonna hit, but the social justice and economic opportunity aspects of resilience. So talk a little bit more about that. Sure. The, I mean, governments are broke, forgive me, um, not just broke because Broke or broken? <laughs> I, I'm, using, I'm using broke in the sense of um, don't have the money and the resources to actually bear the burden of the costs that are associated with this recovery. So you want to, again, buttress at the, at the local scale how are we going to prepare? And communities pay the price. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, looking at the insurance debate today, just around flood insurance premiums. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are evacuated from their homes and they don't know where to move because should you rebuild? And, and there are legislative and policy, of course, is at the forefront of this issue because, you know, do you allow residents to rebuild there? Or do you say, no, we're gonna take a pr protective measure and we're gonna lead with a strong arm and relocate you. Mm -hmm. you know, which, you know, there are long, it's the long-term aspects of the practice of resilience of, of where, where the issues are. Mm -hmm. So, Max, you're in the solutions business, right? And, you know, you hear the problem and, you hear, and the frame of reference. So what is 100 Resilient Cities doing? What, what's the goal? So 100 Resilient Cities is the Rockefeller Foundation's $100 million plus commitment to help cities build um, resilience to the physical, social, and economic challenges that they face in the 21st century. And so what we do is help cities understand all the challenges they face. So it's not just the physical challenges they face. It's not just the ones from climate change. It's uh, crime and violence. There's the false it's, construct. It's, right? Exactly. <laughs> it's, and it is a super false construct. Um, the chronic food and water shortages, uh, the, a bad um, electric grid. 
and look at all of those things together because we really believe that you, you can't separate them out. That if you really want to make a city stronger and if you want to make a, uh, a city able to last for the long term and uh, do right by its citizens in both good times and bad, you can't just think about the shocks. You mm -hmm. must think about the stresses. And any disaster, or any major shock we've had in this country has borne that out because it's the, it's the poor and vulnerable who really, you know, once you get past recovery, mm -hmm. it's the poor and vulnerable who really take it on the chin. Mm -hmm. And so we are dedicated to helping cities around the world think about their, their planning and their challenges holistically. And from those 100 cities, build a global practice of resilience where all cities think about these things as connected. OK, so let's get a little more specific, because sure. that's, that's a big bite to chew. Yeah. Right? We're going to deal with crime and social equity yeah. and weather-related disasters. So, it, so give us an example of, of how you're helping a city, specifically, tangibly, be more resilient. Sure, so uh, in one of our cities. And to what? Um, so we're in various degrees of um, uh, the process with many of our cities. But in one of our earlier cities, we've gone through this process with them and realized that um, they have a uh, huge exposure to, to seismic threat, which they haven't really internalized because they've been focusing on crime and violence. Mm -hmm. And they have um, no real building codes. And so the two of those things together mean that they face serious exposure to a, a shock, which is um, obviously uh, an earthquake. And so it's helping them. It, it was, this process helped surface that and is now helping them address it. They're doing not just soft story retrofits, but also earthquake education, uh, building codes, working with developers, and working with the community to understand what needs to happen in the event of an earthquake because your building was not built to withstand something like that. So um, designing then, for resilience is really, we were talking about retrofitting yeah. for resilience. Yeah. Just, I mean, because we're not really going to be building mm -hmm. from nothing. So it's a question of figuring out how to build in. Yeah, and I mean, if you look at, especially if you look at the, the global south right now, 45% of the city infrastructure that's going to be built in the next 20 years hasn't been built yet. Mm -hmm. And so it's making sure that not just fixing what's been done wrong in the past or done without the right knowledge in the past, but it's making sure that there's this practice so that as you're moving forward, mm -hmm. you're, um, you're, you're, as you're growing, you're doing, you're doing it the right way. So I'll give you another example. Uh, Bangalore used to have um, thousands of lakes in, in the city, and they served as a water source in the summer and a place for runoff during the rainy season. They've essentially, in the pursuit of economic development, have paved over most of those lakes. Mm -hmm. So now when it rains, there's, there's massive flooding. And, when it, uh, and then in the summer, there's no water. And so helping the cities of the future deal with that is one of our key, mm -hmm. uh, one of our, our key missions. Deal with it in terms of a planning yes. perspective and how to actually do it. How to, so it's roll back it's, the it's, changes. It's, exactly, it's both. It's okay. looking forward and, and looking back. What does Bangalore do now? Mm -hmm. Pam, can you give us a couple? Like, yeah. Some, and I know we've got at least two New Yorkers here who are very passionate New Yorkers. So we've got to talk about New York. I'll give you two New York and examples. And one, one I know would love it if you would talk about. We were talking about um, a New America project on mesh um, communications. Sure. Uh, it would be great if you would p throw that yeah. advertisement out here for New America. I mean, it, it, it is. Um, it's easy to beat the New York drum when you're outside of the city, but <laughs> it also because New York has. Um, also its own challenges and failures. Mm -hmm. So the, the community infrastructure mesh network um, project of New America is a great example because it shows where communities have taken the charge with the help of, of New America, civic, civic organization kind of doing its job as a facilitator and a, and a partnership and a broker to bring resources and knowledge. And, and essentially Red Hook, you know, in the 1980s was on the cover of Time Magazine is the, you know, crime, the crack capital of, of the US. And there's a largest concentration of um, NYCHA, you know, um, housing there. And residents, th with New America's help, were, were partnership with the Red Hook Initiative, a youth organization to bring, to install mesh networks, which is basically, in, and don't ask me about the technology and the specifics, <coughs> but to bring routers and internet access, brought, to residents installed and trained by um, the youth themselves, and they manage the network. So when Sandy hit and the power generate, you know, power generation went out, these routers are battery powered, so they endured. FEMA didn't have access to Red Hook, and I neglected to say that it's on the waterfront, um, and it was again extremely hard hit. So FEMA used this network mm -hmm. to contact residents, deliver services. 
And it's that sustainability of a system in the threat of a storm that makes it resilient. It wasn't designed for, oh, a hurricane is coming, what if we don't have um, internet access? It was designed because the, the systems, the, in New York, Time Warner doesn't go there. The residents can't afford their internet, which is another topic. Mm -hmm. So the aspect of resilience is that you're solving for one social justice problem, but you're able to address another need that may be climate change related. Another example in and, that. But just, I mean, the point is to get sure. to a point where that's on purpose and not accidental, right? Correct. Where, mm -hmm. you're, where you're looking at it from a systems point of view, basically. Right. And an impact today point of view. Mm -hmm. Like you're serving a need that is unmet today. Mm -hmm. So you can weather a storm, whether it's economic, environmental, um, crime problems, more in the social, social domain uh, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so, so the second example, to, to try to summarize quickly, because there, they are complex problems, is Co-op City which is the largest private development in the country. There are about 15,000 units in the Bronx and um, was never financially solvent. And part of their, uh, we're, we're gonna start, it's a co-op, we're gonna start taking care of ourselves with state support. They, one of the aspects is that they installed a cogeneration plant to produce their own electricity because they said, we can get some energy independence and if we do this right, we're gonna save a lot of money and we're gonna sell back to the grid. And this was done again pre-Sandy. When Sandy hit, it was one of the only communities that kept the lights on. So again, wasn't, it was done for more economic purposes and to protect and ensure this kind of community infrastructure um, and had the ancillary impacts. Mm -hmm. So, Nikhil, is this the kind of thing that your company wants to see happening? Mm -hmm. And you're a profit-making enterprise. How do you encourage it? How do you actually engage? Well, you know, I, I often think about my uh, business in, in, in a personal context. I mean, um, w when I buy car insurance, th the first thing uh, the car insurance company wants to know is, am I taking measures to protect my assets, to become a better driver, to basically eliminate the possibility of loss? And then what they're doing is they're selling me a car insurance policy, which puts a price tag on my risk. And obviously, I, I'm not yet fortunate to have any teenagers driving. So, uh, but when so that your does, rates are reasonable. My, my rates sure. are a discount, I'm sure. But um, the day that does happen, I'm sure um, I'll, I'll be penalized for the greater risk. So, similarly, in our dialogue, for example, with cities, um, we try to think through. Okay, insurance is really on the, the tail end of a process to hedge you for this unexpected risk, so that when the bad things happen, you can be back on your feet. But our first focus is, what are all the things you're doing before that, so that not only is your insurance cheaper, but more critically, um, you're really focusing on managing the risk, which makes the insurance that much more sustainable. Um, you know, um, I'm a recent New York transplant, but um, a lot of my work has been in the emerging markets where you don't have access to the kind of financial and fiscal resources that our public sector does. And so a lot of governments have had to turn to these insurance instruments um, as the best way to hedge themselves against climate risk. So Haiti is a good example. Haiti buys, for example, a hurricane and extreme rainfall insurance policy. So that you know, 10 days or two weeks after they have a major storm, the government has some liquidity to keep, for example, police in the streets. Um, why I raise about the New York question is, for many years when I used to have this discourse in the United States, uh, the public sector officials would say, well, we have plenty of resources. You know, I have insurance for my buildings. I don't, I don't need to talk about this fancy stuff you're telling me about. Um, that all changed after Sandy. And New York City, through the MTA, bought one of the first what's called a, a CAT bond, but it's basically an insurance policy that looks at storm surge risk for the city. And besides the fact it better protects New York City's assets and therefore reduces the burden on taxpayers, for me, the remarkable point of the story is, for the first time, the average New Yorker can basically go on a Bloomberg terminal or to, you know, uh, uh, the media, you know, to a website and see the cost of New York City's exposure to storm surge. It brings transparency that allows you as an individual to actually make decision making. What I'd like <clears throat> to see, of course, is that in the case of Haiti, that public good of the insurance policy was turned into a product that everyday Haitians could buy so that they could actually on that same basis be protected against the same, same perils. And I'd like to see that same thing happen for us in the US because the public sector may move first, 
but that transparency around pricing, around risk, should also be to the benefit to us as individuals. And so this idea of solving many problems with one intervention mm -hmm. yeah. is uh, axiomatic to the practice of resilience. Right. And so one of the things that I think we all work with our cities to do is by trying to give them a uniform um, or a complete understanding of their risk mm -hmm. and encouraging, encouraging them to work across silos of government, they can then use their limited resources governments are broke, mm -hmm. to accomplish many more goals. And so if you, you can take even a small example, the, the government of Boulder, Colorado, faced mm -hmm. massive floods, um, parks that were too focused outside of the city, and uh, a population that um, had some health risks. And instead of just building a flood wall or an elevated bank along their river, uh, along the stream that runs mm -hmm. through town, they turned it into a park and a bike lane. Mm -hmm. And with minimal extra cost, and began addressing uh, oh, and a fourth was that there's massive traffic, uh, and so which you wouldn't think of in Boulder, Colorado, but there there is, um, and so began addressing four different problems with one intervention. Mm -hmm. And so what we, I think everyone in this community seeks to do is by giving cities a more holistic look mm -hmm. um, at the problems that they face, helping them better uh, address them with single interventions. I mean, this is kind of in spite of governance is is what it sounds like. Certainly of the federal government, I think. The federal government's not going to address these problems. The, the Is that part of the reason you're focused on cities? Yeah. The, the conflict plays no. out at the local scale. Right. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. why it's a, it's a design and practice area around resilience, because the conflict is there, the response needs to be there, the, the community residents are there, the people impacted are there. Does the federal government really know who's in that neighborhood or that elderly woman who can't make it down the flight of stairs? Governor Maybe. Kasich definitely yeah. did stuff. <laughs> Neighbors know. I, I, I do, I mean, and I know maybe you'll be happy to this as a former, you know, employee for the federal government. I, I don't, I believe, and I also say this as a recent immigrant to the U.S., I believe fundamentally also in the role the federal government has to play. Sure. And um, I think, again, when I look at my other clients where it's really federal governments who are taking the lead because of a dearth of institutional capacity at the subnational level, we have a tremendous opportunity in this country because we not only have a phenomenally con competent subnational structure, but candidly put, we have the federal government that I think, despite what other people may think, actually does care. The question is, given the complexity around these issues, can we provide a couple of bold ideas that are game changers around this issue of resilience, risk mapping and risk pricing, and, and that's a struggle. Yeah. But I, I think you have a lot of natural energy, and I do think the federal government can do bold things that set benchmarks for others. I, I absolutely yeah. completely. That's, yeah. And that's good. I mean, but yeah. it does, just from my point of view, it does sound a little bit like you're all working around the fact that government constructs aren't working to fully address this. It's, yeah. it, it's a, I think it works both ways. I mean, whatever, anyone who works with a government at any scale, you hear about silos. So it's breaking down <laughs> silos at whatever level you're we working on. We call them on. silos of excellence. Okay, <laughs> well, that, that happens. I, I've, heard, I've heard other stories. So it's, it's fostering, it, you know, and the, we, the, the great stories always come when there's cross-sector collaboration. And that happens vertically as well. So getting, whether it's whatever role the fed, federal, whether it's in this country or another country, are going to play, even if it's, you know, flood insurance premiums or data access and provision, creating that integration between the levels of federal, state, municipal, or regional, if, you know, if it's Germany, that, you're, that you can create a framework of cooperation and execution. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you're creating these chief resilience officers, right? Mm -hmm. But this is something cities didn't do for themselves. It's something right. that you're advising them to do. And how receptive are they to being told from an external group that this is the way to go? Um, it sort of depends what you mean by this. Um, so working across silos of government, I think cities do recognize the importance of doing that and have been able to do it in varying degrees of, with, with varying degrees of success. Um, I think that our, the cities that we're working with have been very responsive. Um, to our you know to our our program and our um, insistence that they hire a chief resilience officer, but they applied, so it's not like we're we're going in <laughs> right. there and telling them they have sure. to do it. They've sort of recognized the benefit and, of this. And model. what does a chief resilience officer do? So a chief resilience officer, um, speaking to, to Pamela's comment, works um, 
works across silos of government and sectors of society to make sure that, to improve planning, to make sure that you know, the Department of Transportation is working well with the you know, Department of Public Safety, is working well with um, you know, the biggest business, you know, business group in the, in the city, A. B, the Chief Resilience Officer in the short term is working, um, is leading our strategy process in the city, is, is okay. leading the process of uncovering the risks, uncovering the opportunities, and doing the gap analysis to determine what it is that the city needs to focus on. And then is there a problem they're solving for, or is it all the problems you laid out? I mean, is it, is it still using climate change as a vanguard, or? No. It's everything. It's everything. We mm -hmm. see, I mean, climate change, uh, it's climate change, globalization, and urbanization are the three reasons we think that our work is important, but it's not just mm -hmm. solving for. Got it. Uh, solving for climate change. I mean, frankly, there are many cities in the world where climate change is not the first, fourth, second, no. third, fourth, mm -hmm. or fifth biggest problem that they have. No, the military calls it an accelerator of yeah. instability. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, it sort of it makes everything else worse. It, that's exactly right. I mean, and then in a place um, in uh, like Norfolk, Virginia, mm -hmm. which is on the water, has seen 14 feet of sea level rise in the last mm -hmm. 50 years because it's actually sinking, yeah. and because they have a major military base that is also the, uh, the driver of their economy. Climate change may very well be their single biggest issue, but many cities that's not the case. Let, let me ask you a controversial Please. question and then you can say what you <laughs> wanted to say, which is, I mean, but is your industry, um, both insurance and mm -hmm. reinsurance, de facto shaping how people respond to this? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you, you, people won't be able to get insurance in certain places, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't, I don't think we are, unfortunately, for a very simple reason that insurance penetration is so low. Mm. Um, if you look in the emerging markets, uh, where obviously a lot of this debate is going on, for every dollar of economic loss, uh, less than seven cents is covered by insurance. Uh, I mean, that's unimaginable that 93 cents of every dollar of economic loss is falling on someone else's shoulders. And um, in the industrialized markets, it's not much better. I mean, look at Sandy. You're talking about um, a massive bill that was picked up by the federal government, and I think something probably 30 or 40 percent of the loss was insured. And that's in the most developed insurance market in the world. Mm -hmm. So the short answer is no, we're not. But one of the things we're trying very hard to do is what we call closing the gap, which is close that gap between economic and insurance losses, particularly in issues related to climate, because uh, we do believe we have a role to make people think better about the risk. That said, and I'll make my comment very brief, one of the things, and we touched on it earlier in the room about the role of the private sector, you know, I can't speak for all private sector companies, but as Swiss Re, we fundamentally believe in this debate, it's both the private, private and public sector have a role. And I know some people say the private sector must have all the solutions. It's quite the contrary. I think that when I look at the interaction with my clients, you know, one of the things we do is um, provide insurance instruments for, for example, the combined risk of drought and high energy prices. So we have clients who are oil and gas companies who buy that kind of coverage where they, or energy companies who have to run hydroelectric plants, and that's a problem for them. But we also have governments who are those kinds of clients. And what I find is public sector clients may take longer to come to the solution, but when they do, so much thought has been put into it, it's a solution they adopt for a long time. And I think on this debate around how do we address climate change, we need solutions that aren't just the flavor of the month, but ones that have been thought through and are adopted for a long-term practice. So are you in it for the long haul? Me? Yeah. 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 We're in it for the long haul. We will work <laughs> with cities and for as long as we can. I think turn the page back from yesterday and the conversation around Detroit and Passion's very thoughtful point that Detroit is everybody's city. I mean, it's not a climate change issue about what happened sure. there, right? So it's this economic resilience aspect that happens at the front stoop, you know, the front porch, street fronts and water fronts of, you know, how we can have a coordinated response and, and just take care of it. Yeah. And Detroit's a great example of why we can't just think about shocks when we're talking about that's resilience. Right. I mean, yeah. that's so a quintessential example. shock would be like extreme weather events, yes. and a stress would be? A monolithic economy, where mm -hmm. yeah. an over-reliance on one industry. So. Yeah. And, and that resilience should hit all things. So, yeah. I mean, in other words, there's nothing not to like about this. If you're an individual who doesn't <laughs> believe in climate change, this is all to the good, right? Yeah. This is about right. building uh, public mm -hmm. works infrastructure mm -hmm. that's better for your economic development. It's about building human opportunity. It's about and, education, it's oh, about, mm -hmm. yeah, and I mean, people laugh, but it's absolutely true. I mean, 
there are places where they don't think that climate change is, is, is real. And whether we agree with them or disagree with them, that is the reality on the ground. And help, you know, those places still, deserve, you know, still need help building resilience. Mm -hmm. and, and you can take very simple steps towards savings. So that's, that's where, yes, it is climate change fundamentally across the board, but you don't, you almost, it's like the term resilience, you can, it, it doesn't matter it's saying, in my opinion, saying the word so much, it's the practice and the action that matters. And they can, there can be very small steps. Um, I just, we have just a little bit of time left, um, but one last question I have um, for you, Nikhil, and then if you want to make closing comments, is um, do people really understand risk? Do they, do, they, do they not understand the risks or do they decide to take them? Mm -hmm. And is that because you said 30 to 40 percent with Sandy was insured? Mm -hmm. Was that people not understanding the kind of risk they were taking or did they decide it was worth taking the risk? Uh, I, I think uh, risk is, by all nature, risk is a very difficult question to wrap your arms around. And again, I mean, mm -hmm. we can talk in the esoteric about what is climate risk, or, but even on a personal level. Um, again, I like to speak on anecdotes of what I've gone through. I mean, I remember the first life insurance policy I had, um, I got a rate and it didn't feel right, but only after getting a second quote did I realize, my God, what's going on here? Um, and I realized I had to make some changes in my own lifestyle. And um, that's one of the things that... Um, you look very healthy now. Well, thank you. you as, as my colleague says, it's all black and tar on the inside. But, um, no, but I, I think that... Um, you know, the, the underlying point is, is that risk is really hard to get a hold of. And there are certain mm. natural things you do, but a, a lot of it is also trying to figure out um, how do we benchmark what risk looks like. And, and that's what insurance partly does, mm. but it's all these other things to try and put a cost benefit on how we improve mm. our lifestyles. And I think that's what the resilience efforts are trying to get around to do. I think we're out of time, but I just want to thank all the panelists and also... I, you know, I hope everybody got the point that this is a very uplifting topic and an uplifting <laughs> panel, because these are people that are actually solving the problem. Um, so it's thank you for what you're doing and for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks.